So today um, is Resurrection Sunday, right? And they are going to say some speeches about what Jesus, how Jesus lives for them. And it's actually Jesus lives for me. And after they will share, then we're going to have a couple of testimonies from some teens after that about what Easter means to them. Okay, so we're going to start. And remember... Jesus lives for me. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. John 11, 25. Amen. Jesus lives for me. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. We celebrate Easter with family and friends because Easter brings joy and that joy never ends. Long after the candy surprises are gone, the real joy of Easter lives on. Because God loved us, he promised the, his perfect son, Jesus, our Savior and friend. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the, um, during the time of King Herod, Magi of the East came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> have come to worship him. When King Herod heard that this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had called together all the people, the chief priests, teachers of the law, he asked them, where is the Messiah to be born? Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, and by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who is the shepherd of my people. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He had sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On to the coming house they saw, and the child was with his mother, Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Who is? Why does everyone need a savior, even you? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. Amen. When Jesus was grown, he took all of our sins and died for them all. Then he rose up again. The blessing of Easter, I think, is great. Jesus is a great for me. Right now. John 20, verse one, two, three. One through eleven, I'm sorry. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Amen. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. 
Peter therefore went out and the other disciples and they were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the disciples and one disciple outran the other. Peter came to the tomb first and he stooping down and looking in saw the linen cloths that, that were there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the other linen cloths, but folded together in a pile by itself. Then the other disciples came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went ahead, went away again to their own homes. John 20, verse 11 through 23. But Mary stood outside by the tomb, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting at the head of the others, and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had laid. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She supposed him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that she had spoken, that he had spoken these things to her. When the same day, then the same day at the evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The blessing of Easter, I think you'll agree, Jesus is living for you and for me. Right now, yes, beside us. Our Savior is near. He is living, forgiving us, bringing us cheer. Jesus lives forever. Then Jesus came to them and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So you must go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and you can be sure that I am always with you to the very end. But wait, yes, this story's not through. Because Jesus lives, now we know we'll live too. Amen. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. It tells you how much God loves you. Yes, you. Now, now nothing can keep us... From Jesus our King, not sin, Satan, death, no, not anything. Amen. I am at 
absolutely sure that not even death nor life can separate us from God's love, not even angels or demons, the present or future, or any powers can do that. Not even the highest places or the lowest or anything else can all creation can that do, do not. Anything at all can ever separate us from God's love because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done. Romans 8, 38 to 39. Celebrate Easter, it's Christ's victory. He lives, Jesus lives, and he loves you and me. Matthew 26, verse 36. My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. He suffered and died for me and the sins I've committed. Easter means to me that Jesus didn't want to go through the pain and suffering on the cross, but he did it because he is obedient to his Father. When I'm out in the world, I think about his suffering to remind me I need to do what is right. I need to be willing to do the things I don't want to do, but to do the right thing, because I want to live in obedience to Christ. I'm also reminded that he is giving us the gift of eternal life through him. Amen. Before, when I was younger, me and my family would dye eggs, and I knew why we celebrated it, but I didn't think I fully understood it. But now when I think about the meaning of Easter, it's about Jesus' sacrifice of his death on the cross for us, even though none of us deserve it. Um, to me, Easter is a reminder of all the miracles that God um, can do for us. And it all started with the miracle when Jesus rose from the dead. <clears throat> Easter is a reminder of the greatest sacrifice, which is something that we're so unworthy and undeserving of, which is Jesus' death. It shows me that regardless of all the shame and weight of our sin, Jesus came for us all, and there is nothing that we have done that is too much for him. His love is stronger than anything that we could ever know. Uh, I know that Jesus sacrificed his life for me, and that he loves me, and that he gave us this chance to, he gave us this chance to just ask him for forgiveness for all of the sins that we do, and he. Yeah. Uh, Easter means to me that Jesus died on the cross uh, for all our sins, so that we could have eternal life. Um, even though none of us are perfect, uh, Jesus still died for all of us, and. Um, Seeing that he went through all that suffering, I know that nothing in our lives is going to ever be that hard, so it just tells us that we'll be able to get through it. Uh, Easter means to me that Jesus was suffering for us to be able to see him one day in heaven, and that he died on the cross for our sins, even though we didn't deserve it, so we could see him in heaven one day. To me, Easter means that Jesus took the ultimate punishment to save us from ourselves, our sins. Um... Um, Easter signifies to me that um, not even death could hold Jesus down, and he conquered the grave so that we would not be punished there ourselves. Amen. Amen. To me, Easter is a chance at new beginning, because even, even though we make mistakes, we can always start anew in God, because he loves us and wants the best for us. Jesus Christ is in Jesus. All right. We heard Jesus Christ, so that's exactly right. Hebrews 12, 10 and 11 states. that better? For our heavenly fathers, our earthly fathers, excuse me, for our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best that they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we may share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. But afterward, there is a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. Amen. The skit that Brother Herb and Brother Henry 
are doing today talks about God's discipline. God's discipline is sometimes painful, but it is always purposeful. It is sent directly from him through love and compassion. God's chisel. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are God's workmanship, created in Christ for good works. I don't know about you, but when I look in the mirror, when I get up in the morning and look in the mirror, I don't see a workmanship. I don't see a masterpiece. Maybe a Picasso, but not a masterpiece. <laughs> so, I do want to be a masterpiece. So what I do is I go to God in prayer and say, God, remove everything and anything that's in me that's not of you. Mold me into your son's image. A masterpiece. God. Oh, who are you? I'm God. No, you're not. Yeah, I am. You said the prayer, and here I am. You see, that's how it works. Okay, if you're God, make it snow in here. You know, I can make it snow in here, but that can get kind of yucky. See? I don't want to do that. You're not God. Why do you say that? God wouldn't say yucky. Yeah, I do. It's a Greek word. Oh. <laughs> okay. So, if you're God, what does Lamentations 15.9 say? You know, Lamentations is a really short book. It only has five chapters. What, why is it so short? I was tired of lamenting. <laughs> okay. So if you're God, who's going to win the World Series this year? You know, I'm not too much into playing games. Why are you into playing games? Huh. You are God. What gave it away? <laughs> well, you answered my question with a question. I did? Oh, I did. I do that sometimes, don't I? I did it again. All right, here we go. Come on, step right up. Okay. Uh, what's all this about? These are the tools I'm going to use to make you into my original masterpiece. Oh, but but I thought I thought you were a carpenter. No, that's my son. All right, come on, here we go. Step right up. Uh, hold on a second. So, what do you? How do you know what to chisel and what to leave? See, I take you out everything in your life that's not of me. Kind of like that dead weight. Hmm. Speaking of dead weight, if you could cheese it right in there. <laughs> yeah, the went away, but this, if you could cheese it right in there. I mean, I've tried exercising. I've tried watching what I eat. I even tried Pilates. <laughs> that was awkward. But this, if you could chisel right all in. All right, all right. You want to talk, it cannot chisel. Talk chisel, talk chisel. No, 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 no. Go ahead and chisel. Most of my children like to talk. Not me. Bring on the chisel. <laughs> all right, here we go. You have some anger. And some pride. And you compare yourself to others instead of me. You're lazy, <laughs> and you pretend to be really, really busy, <laughs> and you have a problem with lust. Oh, hang on a second. Time out. I do not have a problem with lust. You don't have a problem with no, lust? No, I don't. I can do it any time I want. Okay. <laughs> All I'm saying is, how about we take a little time out? I think I'm doing pretty good. You are doing pretty good, but when you look in the mirror, who do you see? Oh, I see me. <laughs> then I need to keep chiseling away because ultimately, I need you and others to see my son. <sighs> Don't take this the wrong way. The thing is, when I begin to look more like your son, people around me become very uncomfortable. Even my friends at church are like, oh, so you're holier than that. Why don't you do this or why don't you do that? See, what you're doing right now is that you'd rather play God over certain areas of your life than for me to be God over your whole life. I didn't say that. That's what you meant. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
Man, it's hard talking to you. You know everything I'm thinking before I even say it. All I'm saying is, how about we take a little time out? I think you're doing pretty good work. Let's take, a time, take some time out and come back to this later. You are doing pretty good. But see, what you're doing right now is called control. Now, would you rather control the things in your life, or can I chisel? Control, chisel, control, chisel. No, 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 no. Go ahead and chisel. But can we chisel where I want? That's called control. <laughs> okay, okay. You've been holding on to this for a long time. Are you ready for this? Yeah, but it hurts. It hurts me more than it hurts you. Yeah, right. <laughs> I don't think you understand this pain. I don't understand pain. I know all about pain. I sent my son to die on the cross for sin and pain. But I also did it for another reason. That's to give you freedom. Now, do you know what the definition of insanity is? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. Now, there are things in your life, even back in high school, that just don't work. But yet, whenever you're, you're sad, whenever you're tired, lonely, hurting, or in pain, you run to these, these empty wells, and it just don't work. Okay, I was thinking that your maybe... Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Maybe we could go a different way. Your ways are not my ways. God, I can't be good. You can't be good? I made you good. Be good. Uh, what? <laughs> you wouldn't understand. I, God of all the universe, wouldn't understand something one of my children has to say? Come on, try me. God, I've let you down so much. But you were never holding me up. In this relationship, I hold you up with my victorious, righteous right hand. Oh, man. Hey. Don't forget that. In this relationship, I hold you up. Okay. Go ahead and choose up. But just be prepared for what you're about to find in there. See, God, I know what's in there because I wake up in the morning and it's this little scared kid who looks in the mirror and when they get up, they look in the mirror and dress up like a kid and, I mean, dress up like an adult and act like an adult, but they're not. So just be prepared for what you're about to find in there. See, you've listened to far too many voices for far too long that are not of me. You think you're junk, don't you? I mean, you really, really think you're junk. I don't make junk. What does that say about me? How can I show you that my love for you has no boundaries? I know. Reach into your back pocket. What? Reach into your back pocket. Why? Are you going to argue with me? <laughs> Just reach into your back pocket. But God. Yes? I, I was just saying, God, I'll go ahead and do it. <laughs> you, were just saying my you were just saying my name in vain. Come on, it's just a name, just a saying. It's more than a name, it's more than a saying. It's more than just a bad habit. And I want to teach you something about my name. Now, reach into your back pocket. You know what that is? Oh. This is a page from a journal I had when I was much younger. How did you get this? Hello. Oh, yeah, you got it. Go ahead, read it. I love Jennifer Nixon. No. <laughs> Sorry. The other side. Sorry. <laughs> You know I married her. Yeah, I was there. <laughs> oh, yes. Dear God, today I'm turning everything over to you. I'm not going to hold on to anything anymore. Your word says that you will make me your masterpiece and use me to do great things. I don't see how that's possible, but I want that with all that I am. So please do whatever it takes to make me what you want. I love you, God. And I love you too, Tommy. I love you far too much than to leave you where you are. And this salvation that you seek, don't let it be some, some sentimental gush or some, some head knowledge. I want you to work out every detail in your life. 
And don't compare yourself to others because that's just, just trivial nonsense. You are my original masterpiece. You're my workmanship, and it's in you I find favor. This, don't look at this as a, as a prison, but look at it as a father disciplining his child. You see, a father disciplines the ones he loves. I know, but it's, it's going to be tough. You're right, it will be tough. But you brought into the thinking that everything would be easy when you said yes to me. And that's just not how it works. I want you to do something. I want you to look out there and I want you to say, Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Tommy. No, not how you see yourself or how you fear others see you, but how I see you. Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Yes, you are. And so are you. God does not make junk. You are God's original masterpiece. Um, we live in a time when, uh, as they say, most communication is nonverbal. There's a lot of communication that we use that has nothing to do with words. And uh, one of the things that uh, has happened in the last few years with the digital age that we're entering into is that we use a lot of uh, emojis and stuff with uh, texting and online and, and, uh, and we've seen an increase in the amount of smileys and thumbs up and that kind of thing that's used. And uh, I want to suggest today that that with the resurrection, as we think about the fact that Jesus is risen and what he did in the resurrection, that that is a big thumbs up to mankind. That, uh, that he has provided a thumbs up and then he's waiting for us to provide a response in return. I'm not going to be before you very long today. I'm going to try and, and get this as in as quickly and as efficiently as I can. But the Lord has laid on my heart the, to share with you uh, a few things about the resurrection that, that causes God to just smile down on us and elicits a response from us back to him. So let's pray together and ask for his help. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word. Lord, we pray that you would speak through your word uh, to our hearts. And Lord, we ask that if there's anyone here outside of Christ, that they would be drawn into that personal relationship, that love relationship with you. And we'll thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when we think about uh, Easter, we think about the resurrection, we think about the, the Sunday that we're celebrating this Resurrection Sunday. It's an opportunity for Christians to pump their fist in the air and to say a big yes to God. It's a time for us to, uh, to celebrate and to stand confident. You know, we get beaten down by the world. We get beaten down by the media. We get beaten down on the job by coworkers. There are people who think that you are just narrow-minded, that you just need a faith crutch. There are people who talk down to you because of your faith. But on this day, how many of you know this is an opportunity for us to put our fist in the air and say, thumbs up to God. The first reason that, 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 uh, that I want us to celebrate is because the resurrection gives a thumbs up to God's power. It, it reminds us of God's power. The resurrection was an act of God. Uh, this was not an act of nature. This was not like a hurricane that came through. This was an act of God. Peter wrote that God raised Jesus from the dead. And we benefit from that resurrection. We're the ones who benefit. We did nothing to bring it about, and yet all the benefits of the resurrection flow back to us. It always amuses me to hear after natural disasters in the world when people refer to them as an act of God. Uh, it's even in your insurance contracts, you know, that uh, it's a, they're not going to cover an act of God. 
But the reality is that it's not an act of God that a, a hurricane gets stirred up when the water in the Atlantic uh, reaches a certain temperature and the conditions are just right, it can cause a storm to develop. And uh, that's, that's an act of nature, the way that God has set up the world. Uh, there are certain natural things that are going to happen under certain conditions just because God set it up that way. That's not everything that happens is not necessarily God deliberately going to do this. He allows those things to happen because that's the way the world is set up. And we live in a fallen and broken and sinful world. Amen? But when it comes to the resurrection, there is no natural force that can cause life to come where there is no life. When it comes to the resurrection, there is no law of nature that can bring about the resurrection. And when you go and you visit the empty tomb, when all the other religious leaders that are out there have died and, and are laying in their graves, and you go and visit the empty tomb of Jesus, it's a reason for us to say, hallelujah, thank you, Lord. Uh, that's, that's an act of God, the resurrection. And so it's a way that God says thumbs up to us, and we need to respond in return. You know, God is still sovereign. Amen. And nothing happens but what he allows to happen. Uh, and so even when it comes to natural forces uh, that can converge, uh, none of that happens but what God allows to happen. But when it comes to the resurrection, uh, there is this power that only God has to create life. And we can thank God for that. You know, man has a lot of ability. Man has a lot of power in his hands. Uh, man can, can inseminate and man can clone and man can genetically engineer. But how many of you know that only God can create life where there is no life? The resurrection says thumbs up with a demonstration of resurrection power. And so we need to shout back with a big yes to God, a big thumbs up back to him, to the power of God in our lives. It's our pride and self-sufficiency that prevents us from experiencing that power in our lives. The second thing I want you to see about the resurrection of Jesus is that it is a thumbs up to our resurrection. How many of you know that the resurrection of Jesus is just the first in a long parade of resurrections? Amen. That the resurrection of Jesus is not the only resurrection that's going to take place. The, the fact of the resurrection of Jesus assures us that God is able to pull off the promise of our resurrection. Because if he can defeat death for himself, then certainly he can pull off my resurrection when my day comes. And uh, I thank God for that. It's important for us to remember and to understand that the Bible describes a physical bodily resurrection. When we talk about the resurrection of Jesus, we're not talking about the spirit of Jesus lives on and on like the spirit of Christmas lives on and on. We're talking about a physical bodily get up from the grave resurrection. And that in the same way describes how God is going to perform our resurrection. When you get up, it's not just going to be for God's children. It's not just going to be some spiritual event that, you know, in your spirit, you live on and on and on. There's going to be a physical, bodily, get up resurrection. I like that. Now, that's going to that's take some doing. That's going to take some power. And that's the kind of power that only creator God has. And, uh, and so his resurrection assures us that he can pull off a resurrection and comforts us to know that we too face a resurrection of our own.
There are many who have strained their faith and failed to be able to accept the physical resurrection of Jesus. Why? Because they rely on their five senses and they conclude that I can't believe in something that I can't pour into a test tube and duplicate. I can't believe in something that, that I can't see with my five senses. But I want to tell you that it's, it's no more difficult to accept the power of an atom. Anybody here ever explored an atom? Nobody put it on the table? <laughs> opened it up and looked at it? And yet we don't have any problem putting our faith in the power of an atom that we've never seen, never explored. Somebody just told you that it's true. And, and, and yet, you know, I, I put it this way, that, uh, that, that if you are stuck in a world where you can only believe what you can put your hands on, you've got bigger problems than just the resurrection. Because there's a whole lot of stuff out there that we accept and we don't, uh, we can't put our hands on it. It reminds me of the story of a little boy, and I've told this story a few years ago, it's been a little while, but a little boy who was called to wash his hands and sit at the dinner table, and, uh, and he didn't like the idea of having to wash his hands before dinner, and so uh, he, he's grumbling to, all the way to the sink, and he, he's, he's grumbling to himself, germs and Jesus, germs and Jesus. <laughs> That's all you ever talk about, germs and Jesus. And I've never seen either one of them. <laughs> you see, the, the, the fact of the matter is we accept things because we experience the result of them, not necessarily because we explore them ourselves. I know that Jesus lives because he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. I know the gospel is real because the spirit of God indwells me and he leads me and he guides me. And while I have never seen Jesus with my own two eyeballs, I know that he affects my life on a day-to-day -day basis. Is there a witness in the house? And I want to suggest to you that if you're here today and you haven't placed your faith in that Jesus, there are too many witnesses out there who can testify to his reality in their lives. And so you need to be able to stretch your faith beyond your five, sense, your five senses and, uh, and accept what Jesus has for you. Understanding the resurrection parade that we're a part of, it gives us hope to face whatever life brings our way. It provides for us the confidence that, that neither life nor death nor anything that comes into us, nothing in the past, nothing in the present, nothing in the future, can separate us from the love of God that we are victorious no matter what and uh, I, I like that it, it, there's a story of um, Edith Burns who went to see her doctor um, and his name was a Dr. Phillips and they became good friends over the years she had gone there and they were both believers and uh, on this particular day Dr. Phillips was regretting the fact that Edith Burns was coming in to see her because he had some difficult news to deliver. And so uh, Edith went into the doctor's office and, and, and Dr. Phillips looked sad and solemn and, and uh, she said, what's the matter? Is everything okay? Have you been reading your Bible? You've been going to church? Everything okay? And, and he said, you know, I've got some bad news for you. Your lab work came back and you have cancer. And with a sad, hard look on his face, he delivered that bad news. And Edith's response was, Dr. Phillips, shame on you. You're just telling me that I'm going to get to see my husband I'm going to get to see some relatives that have gone on. I'm going to get to see some friends that I haven't seen in a long time. I'm going to spend time with Jesus. And you're lamenting the fact that you're going to give me my ticket. <laughs> that 
that's, that's faith talking. You see, when we, when we have faith in the resurrection, not just of Jesus, but that it demonstrates the power of God for our own resurrection, that gives us hope and faith to deal with whatever life brings our way. Somebody needs to say amen to that. And so the resurrection parade reminds us uh, that, that no matter what we go through, it's not the last word, but we're always in line for a blessing. There's always hope. And that hope is solidified by the verification and eyewitness of the resurrection. And so I want to suggest to you that when Jesus resurrected from the grave, when he rose from the grave, he gave a big thumbs up to you and to me. Let me keep up with myself here. And this. <laughs> he can keep up with me better. The, other, the next point that I want you to, to understand is that the resurrection gives a thumbs up to a relationship with God that is possible today. You, you know, as I said earlier, every other religious leader is dead and gone. Every other, you can go to their grave, you can go to their site, you can go to their tomb, and you can bow down before it, but they are dead, and a relationship with them is no longer possible. But, but because the tomb of Jesus is empty, and because he rose to sit at the right hand of the Father, he makes it possible for us to have a personal relationship with God today. And so uh, you, you, you can read the eyewitness reports and they're consistent and compelling that, that Jesus is up from the grave and uh, we serve a risen Savior. He's alive today. I like that, that hymn. It says, I know that he is living whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him. What? Somebody knows the song. He's always near. Do you know he would not be near, it would not be possible for us to have a relationship with God today if it weren't for the resurrection. But because Jesus is alive, it is possible for you to pray to him. It's possible for you to, for you to talk to him. And he hears you. And he answers our prayer. And so uh, we, we can give a big thumbs up to that. We serve a risen Savior. And, and you know, the, the hymn writer expressed it another way in the hymn, What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. You know what? It's one thing for us to shout on this Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection. But it's another whole issue for us to take it to heart and understand that he is sitting alive waiting for a personal relationship with you and for me. That I don't have to go through this week all by myself. Somebody say amen. amen. I don't have to face the issues of life all by myself. Because we have and we serve a risen Savior. A personal daily relationship with the Savior is possible. And now it's our turn to give a thumbs up to God. He gave his thumbs up to us as he rose and defeated death. And now it's time for us to respond back to him. And I suggest that there are no doubt some of us that have not made the proper response to the resurrection. Am I right about it? And we all have to examine our own hearts before God. Some of us, if I'm correct, 
are living our lives like God doesn't even exist. Some of us go through our day and even if we know that God is real and uh, we acknowledge him with maybe a uh, Lord bless me in the morning and you know uh, lay me down to sleep at night. But we go through the day as though God doesn't exist, as though his help is not available, as though his spirit is not there indwelling us. I want to challenge you that if you're in that condition today, there is a risen Savior who is alive today, who is wanting to have a personal loving relationship with each one of us. There might be somebody here and you've never acknowledged that Jesus can forgive you your sins. You've never acknowledged that you're a sinner in need of forgiveness. And I want to challenge anybody like that to understand that there is a risen Savior who is willing and wanting and desiring to forgive you. No matter what has gone on in the past, no matter what might transpire in the future, he can offer you forgiveness for your whole life, past, present, and future, and usher you into glory, put you in line for that resurrection. But no matter what the need is in your life, if you're not sure about your salvation, if you're not sure about your relationship with God, I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes right now. And all heads bowed, all eyes closed. Let's just have a moment and talk with God. And if you feel the need to, to come to him today and ask for forgiveness, if you want to see that personal relationship between you and God established today, if you want to know that, that you're in line for your resurrection, to spend eternity with him, ask him to come into your life. Thank him for dying on the cross, for taking the punishment that you deserve for your sin. Ask him to forgive you. Would you do it? Right now, in the quietness of your own heart. We're not talking about joining anything. I'm talking about your relationship with God. Maybe you're here and you know that you're a believer, but you haven't always been living and taking advantage of that personal relationship that he wants to have with you. And no matter what the need is, no matter what the desire of your, of your life is, no matter what God is convicting you about, as you talk to him, I want to pray along with you. And an upraised hand, say, Pastor Tony, just pray for me. Is there one like that? Yes, amen. I see those hands. Yes. Just pray for me. No matter what the need is in your life, the Lord is talking to you. Any others? Just put a hand up. Put it up. Put it back down. I see those hands. And I'll pray for you. Yes. Amen. I see that hand. Last call. Any others? The Lord is talking to you. And you, you want prayer today. Then, Monko, let's stand for that closing word of prayer. And I'm going to invite those of you that raised your hands. Maybe if you didn't raise your hand, but you want to come, let's come forward and let's pray together. Whatever the need is in your life. Amen. Monko, join me for these that have come. For others that raise their hands, for all of us who stand in need of God today. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you. 
that you are a risen Savior. We thank you that you are alive today and you're able to deal with whatever the issues are, whatever the circumstances are that we face. Lord, we pray that you would make yourself real to each one here today. For these that have come forward, Lord, you know exactly what they stand in need of. You know what that prayer request is all about. Lord, if there's anyone in the place, in this house today that stands in need of salvation, we pray that you'd save them today. Lord, for, for restoration, we pray that you would restore such a person today. Lord, for spiritual growth, for that closer personal relationship with you, we pray that you would cause that you would draw them to yourself. Lord, we all stand in need. And we ask that you, by your spirit, would do a work that only you can do in each one of our hearts and lives. May we go through not only this day but, and this week, but through the remainder of our lives, remembering that we serve a risen Savior. Lord, help us to take full advantage of that. And we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.